Hello and welcome back to Geek and Speak, the Geek and Seek podcast. Today we are diving back into the topic of utility lands. Uh, about a month ago, maybe two months ago, we had an episode talking about the best utility lands. Go check out episode 46 if you uh, missed that conversation. But today we're kind of going into some utility lands that we like that we think are maybe just underrated some that we think maybe aren't as good as the best ones but they still have homes here and there especially in commander uh join with me today is preston preston how's it going man good uh i didn't get to be in that last episode so i'm excited to be talking about some fun utility lands this time yeah for sure and then we also have jason jason how's it going going good um i really like utility lands because anytime that you can get rid of a basic land and get a land that's going to give you an added bonus along with getting you mana i always think that that's a good thing uh so i'm really really excited that we're doing a part two it's a little funny you say that considering one of your options for utility land yeah we'll get into that uh, and then, hi, I'm your host, Morgan. Uh, I'm also always happy to talk utility lands. I, I said before on the, I think it was the underrated Cards for Commander episode that I, I still like basic lands. I still run maybe more than I need to, but, uh, you know, there's uh, if you have extra thing that your lands can do, it's obviously very good. Uh, before we hop into this episode... If you would like to support the show and the things we're doing here at Geek and Seek, uh, you can do all the YouTube algorithm stuff. That would be hitting like on this video, leaving comments to let us know what you think about the topic. Uh, be subscribed if you're not already. Share it with a friend. And if you want to go the extra mile, uh, you can head over to patreon.com slash geek and seek YouTube. Uh, we are doing more Patreon specific stuff now. Our after show for our Commander Gameplay series is now only for patrons. And then we also here in a couple weeks are going to film a extra game for the Commander Gameplay series that will only be available uh, to patrons. And we'll find more uh exclusive content for you guys over there as well i forgot to look for a favorite comment of the week i just want to say that uh our newest video at the time of recording this is the modern horizons 3 gameplay video and it was really fun seeing some of the comments on that that one i don't have like a specific one that i i screenshotted for this uh but a lot of the comments were like oh the boys are back or we missed you or whatever and i just thought it was funny like i didn't think it would be that big of a difference from going from an episode every other week to going to one a month. I didn't think it would be that big of a difference, but people were like hype. So I thought that was fun to see in the comments. Hang on a second. I'm taking a look real quick because you know what, Morgan Preston and I never get to pick the favorite comment of the week. Why don't you, why don't you pick your, your favorite comment of, of from that, from that video? So I, I I'm going to go with uh, Malik Tori Hain of uh du bois are back because under uh, because underneath it it says translate to english <laughs> and when you hit know what to... <laughs> oh yeah that's funny and when you hit translate to english it translate to the wood are back <laughs> that makes way less sense <laughs> i mean i i had some wood in that gameplay so i, I mean maybe that's what he's talking about yeah, uh, I just, uh, The Boys Are Back makes me think of High School Musical 3, which is uh, the best Disney soundtrack of all time. You know what's interesting? That makes me think of the movie A Knight's Tale, because the scene when they go back to England uh, yeah. for like the jousting championships or whatever, the song The Boys Are Back in Town is, is playing. So, uh, a couple quick news things. Uh, we'll breeze through these really quick. Uh, to let you guys know, our Discord is now open. You can find a link to it in the description of our videos. Uh, it used to be only for patrons, but now it's for anyone. So if you want to hop in there, uh, we're sharing memes. Sometimes you get to see new videos early. Uh, we're talking about new cards as they're getting previewed. So if you want to join us, hang out, hop in our Discord. There's a link in the description of the video. Uh, and then we also are starting our new Deck Tech series on Friday. Uh, we are going to be doing, whenever we have our Commander Gameplay series, we will be doing uh, deck techs for all of the videos that we, or for all of the decks that we play on that. Uh, and then non-channel specific news, uh, MagicCon Amsterdam is happening at the time of recording. Uh, I don't know who won the Pro Tour, I'm it, because it's still going on right now, but I'm sure that it was well earned. There seemed like there were some cool decks going on, uh, but there are a ton of previews already coming out for upcoming sets. Um, we will not be talking much about those cards outside of our Discord, 
uh, until closer to release date, then we will make sure we do dedicated podcast episodes to talk about those new cards. All right, as we hop into our main topic for today, underrated utility lands. Real quick, I wanted to get Preston's thoughts on a card. Uh, Detection Tower was a card that you were high on when we did the best utility lands episode. You were high on it. Jason was high on it. I was kind of low on it, uh, but I just wanted to see if you wanted to uh, maybe talk about it for a minute or so and maybe mention anything that maybe we didn't mention in episode 46 when we talked about the best utility lands. Yeah, so I, I really like this card. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't put it in a deck that's three or more colors just because you got to be really picky about any colorless lands you add in, but... uh. You know, shutting off people's protection is super valuable, and to have that for cheap on a land, like, there's a reason this card is, you know, $2. It's a colorless land, and it's not the most game-changing effect in the world, but having that option there is always going to be really nice. Like, uh, people love to protect their big, scary threats, so having something you can uh, very easily get rid of that to give you a chance to actually interact is going to be important, so... uh and, you know, it's colorless. It can go into any deck. It's not however much money uh, Shadow Spear is at this point. So, uh, yeah, I just really like this land. Uh, I think it's a good idea for people to run it if they can find room for a colorless land on their decks. One thing that I want to piggyback on with that is if you can't afford to put a Shadow Spear in your deck, just add an extra landslide run detection tower because you're going to get a very similar, you know, you're going to get a similar use out of it and then you're going to get the added benefit that it taps for mana. Sure, it doesn't give any creatures lifelink or anything like that, but, you know, what are you yeah, going to do? Spear's you're not you, cracked. You're not buying a shadow spear, so. But detection tower is a good replacement for that. So, uh, I mean, I'm obviously in the minority here between it's you two against me. I am not high on this because it's nowhere near as good as Shadow Spear. Obviously because Shadow Spear is an equipment, but also because Detection Tower is, uh, it only gets rid of Hexproof. It doesn't get get around Indestructible. It doesn't get around Ward, which is all over the place. So it just seems very narrow. I remember in episode 46 when we were talking about the best utility lands, I my one like, okay, I could see it, is uh swift foot boots is very heavily played and so if you're in if like your play group has a lot of decks that have swift foot boots then like maybe this is run sliding in some of your decks but outside of that it just seems so narrow that i don't feel comfortable playing it well i mean think of it from this perspective as well what's easier to remove an artifact equipment or a land not only not only what's easier to remove what is more widely accepted as a form of removal in commander land removal or artifact removal so you know the th another thing that detection tower has going for it is that it's uh, it's a bit durable in a way because people are just you know most of the time not going to have that answer for it and if they do have that answer where it's like destroy target non-basic land or destroy target land or whatever you really think that they're going to use it on a detection tower when this guy over here is running cabal coffers and is generating 20 black mana every turn i doubt it i think that argument holds for most of the lands we're going to talk about today there's a couple on here that like eh, if you got the strip mine they've probably got to go on these but most of these i think are in the in the clear which is extra value to some of these underrated utility lands before we get into it there's one card that i wanted to just give a little honorable mention to um it's halimar depths now i debated putting this on my top three because if you guys know me you know i like to look at the top card of my library um, but just having that sort of information and knowing what's going to come next, it, 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 you know, it's good in the early game because it helps you set up. It's good in the mid game because it helps you with the board state and it helps you in the late game because it can help you finish games or stay alive. Um, so I think that this is a really good land. Um, I don't, I, I don't think that it's better than the other ones we're going to talk about, but I wanted to throw it out there real quick as a land that I'm pretty high on. Yeah, fair enough. It, it is a very Jason card. 
Uh, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and talk about our individual top threes. And then if we have time, we're also going to highlight a couple cards we really liked that we got suggested from uh, the people in our Discord. So again, if you want to be part of the conversation, join our Discord. Uh, but Preston, why don't you take it away with your first card? All right. So first up, I have Throne of the High City. It taps for colorless mana, or you can pay for it and sacrifice it to become the Monarch. I just like the Monarch, you know. I don't think this is by this is probably maybe the weakest card we're going to talk about today, but Monarch is always a fun thing to introduce into games. It gets combat moving. You know, it's a little extra card draw if someone at the table you know isn't drawing as much as everyone else. It's always a fun time. It's one of the best parts about playing Commander, in my opinion, and I just like you can slot that into literally any deck with this colorless land. Yeah, and the Monarch is, uh, at the beginning of your end step, you draw an extra card, and then whenever a creature deals combat damage to you, uh, its creature becomes the Monarch. So yeah, it, it incentivizes combat. You know, if we're just comparing power level, I don't think that this is necessarily as powerful as Halimar Depths, but I think that it's better land for the format, because you got to think about it in, in in all the different ways that you play the game. You know, you don't just necessarily play to, like, be the best player and win every single game. Commander's a multiplayer format. It's meant for people to have a good time. So, you know, I think that this is definitely a, a land that will induce more fun Commander games. Um, like you said, the Monarch is really cool. It's a really fun thing to throw out there. And... You'd be surprised how often the Monarch can change the tone of a game. Because all of a sudden, players are attacking people that they might not normally want to attack in a certain situation. But because they want a mo the Monarch and they want to draw the card at the end of their turn, they're going to do it if they have the ability to. You know, So it can really change the way the games play out. And I really like that about it. And mo The Monarch is cool. And, you know, I'm not necessarily super happy that you have to sacrifice it to do it um because i don't know if the monarch is is ha worth not having a land but i do think that the amount of fun that it can add to commander games totally balances out this the fact that you have to sacrifice it but if you're thinking about it from a, just a strict power level which i don't think that you should with this card um you know you might not be as high on it but it's a really cool it's a really cool land yeah, I've talked about before on the show that I would like to start putting at least one Monarch card in all of my decks, just because it, it does make the game more interesting. It keeps things going, because uh, we've talked about before that we have some games that just drag on forever. It doesn't look like it post-editing, but most of our gameplay episodes are two and a half to almost three hours long. It doesn't look like that after editing, but you know anything that can help incentivize things to keep going and make combat more interesting, I'm here for it. Um, I only have Throne of the High City in one of my decks. It's my Is It Control Combat deck. Uh, but now that I think about it, it probably could go in a couple of my other decks. I agree with Jason that going down the land kind of sucks just to become the Monarch. But the couple decks that I think I could slot it into are Graveyard slash Land decks. So you're either going to be up on the mana anyways, or you can play it again from your Graveyard to get it back so it doesn't hurt as bad that you have to go down the land. So... I only have it in one deck, but I could probably fit it in maybe three of my decks, maybe four of my decks. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, Jason, why don't you talk to us about your first card? Okay, so the first card that I wanted to talk about is Emiria the Sky Ruin. Uh, so it enters the battlefield tapped, and it is it, it taps for a white. But it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control seven or more planes, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Um, early game, this is not the best thing. Because, uh, first of all, it's going to enter tap, so you're not going to be able to use it to play that turn one soul ring. Um, but also, you're not only not going to have seven other planes, you now have to wait seven turns, because this doesn't count itself as a plane, so you have to at least at minimum unless you're playing the catch-up ramp type of stuff that white has um, or if you're playing like a white green type deck and you can ramp the the lands out um, but having to wait for the planes to come in is you know not the best but mid game mid game you know you play this as your seventh land <clears throat> it might enter tapped uh, but you know one two turns later you're going to be able to 
you know, put some creatures back onto the battlefield. And, and, and I think that any land that has this ability to just, like, generate that type of value turn after turn after turn, as long as you have things to feed into it, it's just going to overwhelm your opponents if this goes unchecked. Uh, so it's a really, really cool ability to just have on a land. You know, I love when lands can do something for you besides just tap for mana. And the best part about this whole thing is you don't even have to activate this ability to put the creature onto the battlefield. You don't have to pay any mana into it. You don't have to sacrifice the land or anything. It's just a static thing that happens at the beginning of your upkeep. So once you've met that requirement, this land is incredibly powerful. You're also not casting the creature, so it can't be, like, countered or anything. That's a pretty big deal, too. Yeah, I, I'm high on Amiria. I didn't realize it was, like, 12 bucks. Um, that's unfortunate, because it's really sweet. And it's not, like, broken or anything. It's strong, but, I mean, you need to have seven other lands, minimum. Like, that's... Seven planes, other specifically. planes, yeah. specifically. Right, so... um. What is nice, though, is that it doesn't necessarily say it doesn't care if it's basic planes. So that's what actually puts this high up for me, because if it was basic planes, I would say you would probably jam this in mono white decks, but outside of that, you probably wouldn't play it. But the fact that it's any planes means that you could probably just play it in any creature deck because you're going to have your shock lands, your surveil lands. Uh, maybe you're having other ones as well. Uh, I'm kind of high still on the cycling Amoncat ones. Your triumphs are going to check this. So uh, you can get there, especially if you have green to play like your three visits and stuff to get there faster, but also make sure that you're specifically getting planes. Seems pretty good. Uh, and just because you need so many lands to even turn it on, that means you're already probably in the late game. You might have already seen a board wipe. So you don't have to intentionally be putting things in your graveyard to get value out of this. You will just have things in there, whether they died in combat or there's a board wipe or something. You're just going to have creatures in your graveyard uh, to turn this on in the mid to late game. And another thing, so I don't think that this necessarily can slot into every three color deck that has white. I think two and mono white decks, obviously, but two color decks can, you should absolutely be putting this in as one of your lands because there's, I just don't think that there's any shot you don't meet the requirement in the late game. I mean, you have two colors to work with and, you know, if it's turn eight or nine and you only have two planes out, probably not doing that hot in the game. Um, but in three color decks, you know, you don't necessarily need this in certain ones, but if your three color deck has green, this, this should absolutely be in there because first of all, you're playing green. So you're probably playing big creatures. So it'd be nice to have a land that could just bring those back if, you know, if you're meeting the requirements. But then, like I talked about earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, the ramp aspect of it, where not only are you not having to wait for this card to meet its requirements, you're actually causing, like, like you're uh, performing game actions that are getting it to that spot. Um, so I think that it absolutely slots into mono color white decks, uh, two color decks with white in them, and then three color decks that have white and green. You know, outside of that, you can kind of, you know, at your own risk, or if you build a deck that just has more planes in it, then it works well in there. But I think once you get into like four and five color, just not that great but that's why i have it at my number three i i will say it's also twelve dollars so that can be a reason you don't just immediately jam it in there yeah i've definitely had one or two decks before that i was like "Ooh, amiria would be sweet i don't know if i want to spend twelve dollars on it though I, I feel like it's one of those cards that it has to get reprinted eventually so um i'm just kind of holding out for that but yeah it's a sweet card Okay, uh, my first one is not a very flashy card, but I dig it. Uh, this is Cathedral of War. Uh, it's a colorless land that enters the battlefield tapped, but it has Exalted, which means whenever a creature you control attacks alone, that creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. So this is not a very flashy or exciting card, but it's good in like one specific kind of deck. And we did a whole episode about it, boys. Voltron. This is cool in Voltron decks. You're going to have other creatures in your Voltron decks, but the one that you care to attack with is your commander, 
or or some hidden commander and that means you're probably only attacking with one creature so the exalted is going to be triggering um that probably still doesn't mean that this goes in literally every voltron deck but the plus one plus one is nice uh i actually found that having plus one plus one stuff is kind of redundant in my Kozlek deck because he already starts with 12 power so no matter how much i buff him it's still going to take two hits unless i like give him double strike or something right but if you have like one of those voltron bills that we talked about in that episode where your creature starts off smaller but it has a lot of good keywords then this goes up in value a lot so i think if you're a voltron deck that is starting off with a little bit of a smaller power toughness chef's kiss Here's another thing that I'll say that kind of goes in this card's favor. Unlike, you know, some of the utility lands that we're going to talk about, um, particularly the one that I just talked about, this is not necessarily a enter the battlefield, do nothing immediately land. It has exalted, so it's going to enter tapped, but you can still utilize that ability by attacking as soon as it comes in. So even though it can't tap for mana when it comes down, you know, it's still going to give you an, an, an a bonus right away that's another really good thing about it is that you know mid or early game mid game late game there is value to be had in this card also one thing i want to point out that is important is that um it's been errated to say tap add one colorless mana to your mana pool so it's not just one generic um and i don't know if, if you're playing a cosmic deck well, it also can matter for certain, uh, like, abilities that, you know, you need colorless mana to activate, like those um, uh, uh, um, Eldrazi Displacer type of effects. Where, A you lot know, of you Eldrazi need... just in general, yeah. Yeah, any uh, other thoughts on that one, Preston? Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen this land before today, uh, at least not off the top of my memory, so... Uh... You know, it's not going to change the pace of the game, probably, but I can see this putting in a lot of work in the right deck, so uh, I might have to throw this in a couple of my decks here and there. I kind of like it. Uh, just a good little buff is nice to have. And again, no one is wasting their land destruction on this. No, no. Go, going to go under the radar. It'll It'll put in a little bit of work where it needs to, but for the most part, it'll go under the radar. Here's another thing, too. Imagine you have a creature with trample, but it doesn't have enough power to trample over your opponent's creature to hit them and get the monarch that they have. But then you <laughs> play this. Because they sacrificed their throne of the high city. Because high they land. sacrificed their throne of the high city. Yeah. Uh, Preston, you've got, a, you've got a cool one next. Talk, us about, talk to us about your uh, second pick. Uh, I have the bounce land cycles. So the, uh, the 10 guilds, their... Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you call them, but they enter the battlefield tapped. Uh, when they enter the battlefield, you have to return a land you control to its owner's hand. And then when you tap them, you add one of each of the guild's colors. Uh, so I specifically really like the Simic one. That's like my main go-to. But uh, something people I don't think really utilize a lot with these is the fact that you can choose your you can choose the land for its own trigger. So you play the land... You bounce it with its own trigger, and then you can play it again. That's really good in a Simic deck. Because uh, sometimes in those simic landfall decks, you can start running out of lands to actually hit and get your triggers. I know it's happened to me before. So having a land that can just constantly play itself, play itself, play itself again and again, it it adds up over the course of a game. I've, uh, I've won a couple games with my uh, Simic deck because I could keep playing Simic Growth Chamber like 20 times over the course of the game. Simic Growth Chamber is definitely, I would say, I mean, if you had to pick a best one, it'd be the best one just because, like you're talking about, Simic has a lot of synergies with lands entering the battlefield. But there are other, like, landfall decks that are not uh, um, Simic. So these have value in those decks too. And not only that, but they have value for the other utility lands that you play. You know, like, let's say, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of, like, uh, Halimar Depths. <laughs> like, think about Halimar Depths. 
of all it the enters, examples you could use. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the most recent one that I could think of. So, like, it enters the battlefield, you get its thing, but now it's just a land that taps for blue. You play a bounce land, you get the Halimar Depths back into your hand, now you get to use it a second time. So that's another added use that the bounce lands have. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of when we do these lists of people including an entire category of cards into just one card. But I do, I think that this is appropriate for um, for this list. Yeah, I, I do agree with your, your point of being able to pick up lands. The, the best example is I actually just did this on the last episode of our gameplay series where I had to play a Balaged Sanctuary, the backside of Balaged Recovery, uh, just so I didn't miss a land drop. But then when I pulled Selesnia Sanctuary later in the game, I played that, picked up the Balaged Recovery, and I had it for later in the game. Uh, same is true for like the channel lands, like Boseju Who Endures. I did that on an episode, like I don't know, back in the fall or something. I played Boseju so I wouldn't miss a land drop later in the game. Simic Growth Chamber, pick it back up. So they're really sweet. And I actually think that because of their modality with channel lands, MDFCs, um, I actually think that these are auto includes in all two color decks uh, because they're also kind of ramp, right? Because it's a land that taps for two and then it guarantees that you're going to have the land drop next turn, right? So I think that, uh, you know, you're going to sometimes, it's your your land on turn two, right? And you're going to have to discard down a hand size, right? Like that happens sometimes, but like for the most part, uh, I think these are auto include in two color decks. And then I think they have added value. I play them, I have uh, all of the, available ones in my uh, Grixis reanimator deck because I don't mind discarding down a hand size in that deck because I want to put things in my graveyard. So I think these are sweet. Uh, do you guys play them outside of two-color decks? Because uh, you do run into some of those awkward situations. But then there's also Guildless Commons and Arid Archway, uh, which are they tap for two colorless, so they technically could go in any deck. And then Arid Archway specifically is pretty cool because it's a desert, which means there's a lot of cards that can tutor it out for extra value. And uh, if you bounce another uh, desert to your hand, you get to surveil one, so there's extra value in uh, those. So you could those you could run in any deck because they're colorless. But do you guys just run the 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 two color ones, or do you run them in in more decks? Me personally, I'll run these. In for three color decks, I will run one or two. Uh, I just think that there's enough lands out there that provide good value that you don't necessarily need to run a ton of bounce lands in like decks that you know, like three, four color decks like that. Um, but if there's a deck where I know that there's certain utility lands that I'm gonna be able to want to play more than once, um, or at the very least. Here, here, here's another thing that I like. I've done this in games before, where you know it, it kind of has to be in a green deck. Um, but somebody goes to target one of my utility lands that's like, like really nice, like really good, whatever. Um, like if I'm playing my Karth deck and someone wants to destroy my uh, Cabal coffers, you know, um, uh, uh. I'll play, I'm trying to think of the creature's name. It's like, it, yeah, it's like Lana War Scout. I, I don't think it's that one specifically. Because I think that one you can only do at sorcery speed. And I think I have the instant speed one. But I can't, I can't think, card like that, a creature where you can tap it to put a land onto the battlefield. Like I've done that where tap it, put the bounce land onto the battlefield, bounce the Cabal Coffers back to my hand and save it. You know, it's, um, so I think of bounce lands like in all facets, like how can I use this as a form of strategy? Uh, but as far as like making sure that I have my colors, I don't really look at it like that necessarily because I want to utilize the bounce that the land is going to give me. So you, you are saying that you mostly would just play it for landfall synergies or to get back lands with enter the battlefield effects or something. Right. Outside of like two or color like decks. your MDFCs and whatnot. Yes, correct, correct, correct. Um, you know, outside of like two color decks, two color decks, you got to play it. Like, that's just how I feel. If you have a two color deck, you play the bounce land that goes in your colors. That's just, I feel like that's common sense. Yeah, I don't think I, I could justify a five color or a four color deck with these probably, but uh, two or three, I, I think these can definitely be played in those. Because like, Back in the day, people really hated these lands. They're like, oh, they're so bad. 
but we've just gotten so many utility lands like since the early days of commander that getting some of those effects twice is absolutely ground like backbreaking in certain games like this used to be a genuinely negative downside to these lands but nowadays you can abuse it so much that it's just objectively a positive and like i know 65 percent of commander decks like it's just so easy to make this a good thing to have happen you can utilize them for like landfall triggers when lands enter the battlefield, but you can also utilize them for those types of like whenever a permanent leaves the battlefield or like at the end of your turn, if a permanent left the battlefield, like something like that. Like, turn turn on your fatal push. <laughs> I'm just saying it entered and then it left that triggers things. All right. Yeah. Preston, I'm glad you uh, had these. I, I, I've been hoping that we had a, a chance to talk about Bounce Lands at some point, because it is fun that they went from being a card that everyone was like, oh, they suck, to now they're like, no, I really like these. So, yeah, uh, Jason, talk to us about your number two pick. So my number two uh, on this list is Keswick Wolf Run. It is a colorless land, taps for one colorless, enters untapped, uh, but it has this neato little ability on it that says uh, X red green tap. Target creature gets plus X plus O and gains trample until end of turn. This, there's so much utility to this land. But it's, uh, first of all, it's going to enter untapped. So you need it for that colorless. You got it for the colorless. You can turn one this, soul ring it, and, you know, yeah, you only have three colorless mana on turn two, but you're off to the races now. Uh, or let's say, you know, turn one this, soul ring, arcane signet, Boom, now you're good to go. Uh, so it's gonna give you those types of it's gonna give you those types of plays. Um, but then it also just has the ability to make a creature really, really large in the late game, uh, when you know, maybe you don't have many spells to play that are gonna be impactful right now, so you dump all your mana into this, give your creature trample, and just start hitting people for a ton of damage. It's also good in the mid game for a similar thing, because you don't actually have to pay anything into X. You can, X can be zero, and you'll just give your creature trample. So for two mana, tap it, give a creature trample. That's pretty good, too. And you can get sneaky with this. There are people there are people on this podcast right now that have died to me sneaking in a Kessig Wolf Run activation for zero, giving a creature trample. Because they're like, oh, this creature didn't have trample? I'll just chump block it. Here's the thing, bud. It does. <laughs> Um, this card is really cool, and I think that because you can play it in tricky ways and it enters untapped, it's it it it, it deserved that number two spot for me on the list. Even though it is color specific, it's not going to go into any deck. The decks that can have this card really, really, really love this card. Yeah, the fact that X can be zero is what does it for me. The fact that you could just, oh, I already have a decent-sized creature and it's getting chump-blocked, okay, for a red and a green, I'm going to tap this and give a trample. Oh, my God, that's insane. I actually have undervalued this card for a long time. I semi-recently put it in two or three of my decks. It is color-specific, right? So it can only go in decks that have both red and green. But I think if you're a deck that meets that color requirement um, and you just have a decent amount of creatures in your deck... Man, this is such a low opportunity cost. Like you, right? You only have so many colorless land slots available to you, but this has got to be one of them. Also, Voltron decks love this card too. Voltron, yeah, so if you're decks, a Voltron that can deck that can fit deck that's this, in these colors, yeah. You should absolutely be running it. You know, because you can just not. You don't even have to use it to buff your commander. You can just give him trample when you need to. You're probably already buffing him enough that you just pay the two mana to give him trample. Yeah, I don't currently have any decks that have this card in it off the top of my head. Uh, I just don't really have any girl decks. And the only, like, I probably wouldn't play this in four color, but I might in three. But the only one I have that meets those colors requirements is my dinosaur deck. And uh, that, that deck already has plenty of trample. I, I really just don't need this in there, but... uh. This is a very good option for those colors if you do have a deck in red and green and it doesn't already have a bunch of trample built into the deck. You should probably throw this in there. It's only 
15 cents, so it's not like it's going to break the budget. This is a good card. Well, and I actually think that uh, it, it would might be worth doing it anyways, because so the two decks that I put it in, uh, I put it in my uh, Miram deck, right? So Teamer Dragons. And there's a there's other dragons that have trample. I have a couple other trampler uh, enablers in the deck. But the fact that this is an untapped land that can give something trample that doesn't have trample, and it could also buff its power quite a bit, uh, that's pretty spicy. And the other deck I put in, this is the riskier one. I haven't got to try it in this deck yet, so maybe this was a mistake. My my uh, four-color Umari deck that I played on the show. The, it's Umari the Companion. It's all colors except blue. So all of your non-lands have to be creatures. Uh, so, so maybe that was the wrong deck to put it in. But man, in a it's it's a it's a creature deck. It's a big stompy creature deck, and there's only a couple other trample enablers in the deck. So eh, maybe it was a mistake, but we'll see. Listen, I'm gonna go full on and say I just disagree with you, Preston, on four colored decks. I think that if you're playing a four colored deck, not only are you likely going to be able to meet this requirement. But unless you're playing a Trample-specific four-color deck, there's not a lot of options in every color that give Trample to stuff. So having it on a land where, again, we've talked about it, land removal is not something that you see a whole lot in Commander games. Having a reliable card that can just give a creature Trample, in in most four-color decks, you're meeting these color requirements, I think. So... I think that it's an easy slot into four color decks and then five color decks. Five color decks, you're absolutely meeting this requirement. So I think it definitely slots into a five color deck for sure, especially if it's creature based. I run this in my Ur Dragon deck. This is an this is a great card in my Ur Dragon deck. I don't need to pay any mana into it. Ur Dragon's a 10-10. He doesn't need to be any bigger. He just needs to get through for damage so that I can start killing people with commander damage. You know? So I, I, I think that two color decks like obviously has to be gruel if it's two color but two color decks and up can absolutely find a spot for this card unless it's like a spell slingers deck where you're not using a lot of creatures but i just think that you know i i just totally disagree with you on the four color decks yeah so i can see it i I just normally don't play colorless land that much in my multicolor decks once you get to four and five it's just really hard to find ways to make them fit so first of all, we should have a compilation of every time Jason has said this is good with Ur-Dragon. Because um, I feel like he said that probably a thousand times on the podcast. Uh, and there's no way he has a thousand cards in that deck. But Jason is right. I think if you are a creature-heavy deck, a combat creature-heavy deck, it doesn't matter what your colors are. If you can fit the color restriction, I think you play this. All right, so uh, my next one is Deserted Temple. This actually uh, just got two good reprints lately. It got reprinted as a box topper in Tales of Middle Earth, and then it also just got reprinted in Modern Horizons 3, which means it's now modern legal for the first time. Uh, This is a land that taps for colorless, or you can pay one and tap it to untap target land. Um, This has some insane potential. The most obvious thing to do with this is go for your big mana lands. So your Cabal Coffers or your Nykthos Shrine Shrined to Nyx, Guy's Cradle, any of those kind of lands. The lands that are going that are just making obscene amounts of mana. Untap those, do it again. You have even more mana, right? So that is probably the best home for it. However, um, there are other niche situations where you can use this. For example, Kessig Wolf Run <laughs> has to tap. So now, hey, now we can now we can give two of our creatures trample. Um, but you know, we talked about like uh, last time we talked about utilities lands. We talked about Manamo, right? Uh, the the School of Water's Edge. The, you can use it to untap. Uh, legendary permanence yeah so with deserted temple you can do that even an extra time so i think 
it's it becomes very niche once you walk away from I'm using it to untap my Nykthos, Cabal Coffers, Gaius Cradle. Once you walk away from that, Deserted Temple becomes kind of narrow. But uh, there's enough lands with interesting tap abilities that I, I, I feel like if you have a lot of those in your deck, you should be looking at Deserted Temple, especially now that it's reprinted and very, very cheap now. It was like a $20 card, I think, and now it's a uh, dollar for the for the cheap version the cheapest version is a dollar one of my favorite ways to use this card is with bounce lands you tap a bounce land add two pay one to untap the bounce land tap it for two so now you have three you know um another cool thing that you can do with it is um you can untap lands that enter the battlefield tapped like let's say you need to get specific colors but you only have like you know um i'm i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't be i wouldn't be in that situation but yeah you play a duel and the enters tapped and you need one or like one of the colors you just pay this to untap it so you get access to that color um it's it really feels more like mana fixing when you do it that way but being able to untap lands just for one mana, it, it's it's a pretty powerful thing, and, and there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. I don't have this on any decks, but like like you guys said, there's so many ways you can abuse this land, and you know, uh, it's colorless. It goes in every deck. Uh, it's two mana to basically get your best lands effect a second time. It, it's definitely worth using in plenty of decks at this point in magic like early on you know you probably would mostly just use it to get those big manager generation lands but as more utility lands comes out this is just going to get better and better so uh yeah pick up a copy while it's cheap maybe even get a couple in case the price starts going back up so uh yeah i like this card i picked up the uh tales of middle earth box topper one for my mono black deck mm, dude it's so pretty i love it so much it is good art yeah i i love all of those lord of the rings box topper box toppers i, I love all of them uh preston talk to us about your last card all right last up we have rogue's passage uh it taps for a colorless and then you can pay for it tap it target creature can't be blocked this turn this is arguably the best like utility land in commander like that doesn't you you're not tapping it for man or anything just making it so one of your creatures or one of your opponent's creatures can't be blocked in a turn is just so good it's cheap they reprint it in every single precon almost so there's always going to be copies of it laying around that you can throw it in a deck it's just so good so often and uh I just I've always liked this card and I'm going to like it for probably the rest of my time playing magic i like this card i play it um i i wouldn't say i'm as high on it as you are but i do think that it is really powerful when you can make a creature you know unblockable uh i don't like that you have to pay four mana into it it's eh. it's kind of um, five mana because it's four mana and then you have to yeah to yeah that's yeah um so i think it is a little bit too mana inefficient to be like considered the best best utility land in magic but it's definitely good it's definitely powerful and it's 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 one of those late game finishers where you know you have that really big creature out there that you know you just need to get in a couple more times for some damage or if you have like some like effects where like if you deal combat damage you draw cards just ensuring that so you can draw into your win pieces you know that's going to be really nice. There's there's a fair amount of utility for this card to be on the list. It's it's a good utility land. Yeah, this this card always overperforms. Um, I'm going to jokingly say that this is the worst card on the list today because uh, we said that an upside to underrated utility lands is that no one's going to use their land destruction on them. However, on the newest episode of our Commander Gameplay series, do you know what Preston used his strip mine on? Tommy's Rogue's Passage. <laughs> so, just saying, that makes Rogue's Passage the worst card we're talking about today. No, but really, I, I actually really like this card. It always overperforms. Um, 
it's really good in Voltron decks if you're just trying to com- commander damage people out. It's good in the late game if you're just you're really close to knocking someone out, but they have a lot of blockers. It's really good at just getting the last little bit of damage in. Um, and it's also just good if you're playing a combat matters deck. Like if you're just playing a deck that needs to get in on damage. Maybe you had the uh, the throne of High City, right? And we get we're passing the monarch around. You really want to pay five mana to draw a card, you know? Uh, or if you just have like you know an Eastern style deck and you want to like get in for your damage, get your attack triggers, your combat damage triggers. Uh, like if you're playing like Felix Five Boots or whatever. So this card always overperforms. Um, it. It is kind of a steep cost for five mana, but it it's so good. It's if you have a decent amount of creatures and you're wanting to attack, this is sweet. This card is playable if your deck does not care about attacking, because you can use it as a, a bargaining chip. Like, hey, if you guys don't attack me, I'll make one of your creatures unblockable. Like, you don't even have to use it on your own creatures. This can literally go in any of your decks, even if you don't want to attack. So I don't I don't disagree with that, but we should have a podcast episode about like I don't know what we would call it. So this but playing off of that, how much can you rely on your opponents to do X, Y, or Z? Right? Because I I sometimes use that logic, but the more I play Commander, the more I think it's faulty logic. I think for a card to make it into your deck, especially since this is a colorless land. And maybe you're playing like a one or two color deck and it's not that big of a deal. But if you're playing like three to five colors, I think you have to actually be a combat or a creature based deck in order to play Rogue's Passage. Because like you could use it as a bargaining chip, but like I don't I don't think you can rely on your opponents. Because what if they aren't playing creature decks? Also, what I'm going to say is you don't put it into a deck that you know wants to use it as a bargaining chip because why would you pay five mana to help out your opponent i feel like that's just too much mana to waste to make sure that somebody doesn't do something to you i mean if it's like the final blow like if if you have an urge if it's something like that you'll pay the five mana right but yeah if it's something like that for sure but i just mean i i'm not putting it in a deck and planning for that also, one thing I want to say, I do think that it is strange that you said with Kessig Warfront, you don't play a whole lot of de- uh, lands that tap for colorless, and this taps for colorless, and I think Kessig Warfront is better than this, but that's just me. Well, this can go in any deck. I, I don't have that many Gruul decks. That's part of it. One of the decks I play uh, Rogue's Passage in is my Force Combat deck, which is Is It, so I can't play Kessig Wolfrung. Uh But that Rogue's Passage is so sick in that deck because, well, one, I have stuff that I care about. Like, I have stuff that says, when you attack, do this. When you deal damage, do this. I have stuff that goads. I have stuff that uh, cares about the Monarch. Uh, And then it also does have a lot of instant speed stuff in the deck as well because I have stuff that can move combat around to different players. So then, I guess in a weird way, sometimes I will do the thing that Preston says and use as a bargaining chip. But... uh, yeah, Rogue's Passage always puts in a lot of work. Jason, why don't you talk to us about your last card for the day? So the last card that I wanted to talk about really is Alchemist's Refuge, but I'm going to pair it with Emergence Zone because they do similar things. Um, I think Alchemist's Refuge is better, but I'll get into that. So Alchemist's Refuge is a land that taps for a colorless, and it says uh, blue, pay a blue, a green, and tap. You may cast spells this turn as though they had flash. And then Emergence Zone is essentially the same thing. Land, taps for a colorless. But instead of paying one green and one blue, you just pay one generic, tap it, but you have to sacrifice it. And then you may cast spells this turn as though they had flash. Um, I think Alchemist Refuge is better because you don't have to drop a land. And because of that, you can activate this on multiple turns. Um, you know, you're playing, you're playing green. So if you have those um, uh, Seedborn Muse type of effects where you're untapping um, on, on everybody's turn, you can potentially play spells on everybody's turn with this card. Uh, so I think that that gives you some added value. 
Emergent Zone definitely has a spot in several decks, especially if you're playing a deck that doesn't have blue specifically. Because uh, I know I know Alchemist Refuge is blue and green, but if you don't have a deck that has blue in it, you're really you probably don't have a ton of access to instant speed stuff, and this this gives you that ability. Um, and in those decks where maybe you kind of want or need to be able to play at instant speed in certain points, this is an absolute all star in those decks um, because you could just do it out of nowhere. It's gonna sit there for a while, uh, and people are gonna forget about Emergent Zone. I, I promise you, they're gonna forget about it because it's only gonna activate one time. Uh, so when you play it, you're likely not activating it right away. And, you know, if you are, you can absolutely do that because it enters untapped. So you can hold it in your hand for when you need to use it. But, I mean, I just think Alchemist Refuge is better because you don't have to sacrifice the land. There is that color restriction, but in the same essence of, you know, Kessig Wolf Run, any two-color deck and up, if you meet these color requirements, this is going to be good in that deck. I promise you it is. Even if you don't necessarily have to respond to stuff and, and activate this so you can respond to stuff, you can activate this and then play all of your stuff at your opponent's end step and then it goes to your turn and you're untapping so it's almost like you time walked everybody and got two turns. You know what I mean? They are so close to me. Like, I think you're right. I think Alchemist Refuge is technically better because you don't go down the land. You can theoretically use it multiple times. But whatever it is that you're wanting to do at instant speed, you, you're you probably limited. I mean, we are talking about Simic here. Maybe you have a ton of cards in hand. Maybe you have a ton of mana already. So maybe, maybe this is null. Maybe this is a null argument. But you're going two mana, tap this. That's three mana, you're down. That's a lot less stuff that you can be doing at instant speed. Whereas Emergent Zone is less mana to do that, and it's less color restricted, so Emergent Zone can technically go in any deck. But also, like if you're playing like a Sacrifice deck or a Lands deck, the I don't think the Sacrifice is a downside for Emergent Zone because you probably have Crucible of Worlds or something to get it back. So if you're playing like a Lands deck or a Sacrifice deck, maybe Emergent Zone is better unless you have blue and then you could play alchemist refuge instead but to me they're very they're very close i think uh, i think the sacrifice on emergent zone also isn't as big of a downside as you might think in the situation of well one you're not a simic deck but also if you really don't care that you're going down the land because you're going to win on your turn anyways so you have a two-piece combo you have you have both combo pieces in hand and your opponent tap down so you feel like you have a good chance to get in just do it now you know stuff like that so i feel like um or if it's just gonna save you right like if you have a board wipe in your hand and someone's going all out on you you're like well i die if i don't do this so i don't care that i go down the land so i think i think you're right i think alchemist refuge is probably better but it's because i i just think they're closer than maybe you're giving them credit for I mean, I think that they're that they're decently close. You know, I, 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 I don't think that I implied that they were really far off. I just think that Alchemist Refuge is it's going to provide you with more value because it stays on the battlefield. Everything that you're going to get with Emergent Zone is going to happen one time. The sacrifice triggers that you're talking about from that is going to happen one time. You know, um you actually using the ability to play at instant speed that's only going to happen one time so i think that be, that that that's where i'm coming from is why i think alchemist refuge the alchemist refuge is a lot better is because you're going to be able to get it repeatedly now something i will say about um emergent zone is going back to my point about if you don't have blue you can actually still do some really powerful things and it's not that costly to do it. It only costs you two mana really to do it. And, you know, in the same vein of uh, uh, um, Rogue's Passage, Alchemist Refuge kind of costs three mana to do it because you have to pay two and then tap the Alchemist Refuge. So you can only put, you only have to pay two mana really into um, Emergence Zone. And like, let's say, 
you know, you're playing a mono white deck and you have this card and somebody casts a really big draw spell and they're going to draw 20 cards. Well, now you sacrifice your emergence zone and you flash in your smothering tithe. You're going to get a lot of treasure from the, yeah. So there is definitely a good spot for, um, emergence zone in decks that don't have blue. And I think that it's a really, really powerful card when you use it in those types of ways. But I just, I, I'm going to stick to my reliability and, you know, consistency more. Alchemist Refuge is going to be more reliable and it's going to be more consistent. That's just how I see it. But Emergent Zone is also really good. Being able to play anything at instant speed is automatically going to make you a viable card. And there's a reason that CEDH decks play Emergent Zone. I think Alchemist is technically better. But I think Emergent Zone is actually going to be better in more decks because, like you said, blue already does plenty of stuff at instant speed. And green, it doesn't do as much at instant speed, but what it can do a lot is flash creatures. And when you're playing green, the thing you normally want to do is creatures. So blue and green doesn't need this as much as the other colors I feel need Emergent Zone. So that's where I would come from. I mean, I think both are definitely playable. If you can slot them in, I think you should. Uh, getting to do stuff when you're not supposed to is always going to be a powerful effect. I like both of them. They're pretty close. If you can run them, run them. To me, it feels like you're narrowing it too much to green and blue. Like, the same point I made about Kessig Wolf Run can be made here. Two color decks and up are going to find value in this card, especially if you're playing a four or a five color deck. I mean, if you're playing a four color deck that has blue and green in it, what are the chances that you're actually playing to the instant speed part of blue? Like if you have four other colors that you're building your deck around, I mean, I don't think that you're building those decks as heavy blue decks if you're adding in the three other colors. And maybe you are. There's tons of ways to build decks, but I don't think the majority of the time that's the case. So narrowing this down to, yeah, it's, you know, you have to have uh, uh, blue or green, and blue already does stuff at instant speed. I, I, I just think that you're narrowing it too much because this is really good in five-color decks, this is really good in four-color decks, and it's really good in three-color decks. So... I, I just think that you guys are overlooking the reliability of it because it's going to sit on the battlefield for a long time. It's not going to go away you're, unless somebody removes it. So you're going to be able to do this as often as you need to. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. So I think you might be right. Um, my initial thought was, well, Alchemist Refuge, like if you're playing it in a three to five color deck, right? Um, do you want to wait and put yourself quote unquote behind a turn or whatever in order to hold up the mana to do all your stuff at instant speed and in my head I was like no I don't think I want to do that but you have Simic at, at least in your deck right plus whatever other color so if you're really heavy on your Simic shell and you're drawing a lot of cards and you're ramping a lot then maybe it's not really going down the turn so I, I could see that um, so I think uh it, it goes up in value if you have cards that, like, whenever a player draws their next a second card for the turn or casts their second spell the turn. Or if you have cards like that, then this goes up in value a lot, no matter what color you're in. But outside of that, I think maybe it can go up in value if you are also – if your mana can support it, basically. It is a, it does only tap for colorless. Um, so you need to make sure that the rest of your mana base is good. Because I also don't think that this is the only colorless land that you want to play in your four or five color deck, right? Right. And here's one other thing I want to say. Think about how good this card is after a board wipe. Like, let's say somebody wipes the board and it comes back to you and everybody's done a little bit of things, a little bit of stuff to reset. And you just keep all your mana up and pass. And now you don't necessarily have to run all your stuff out there and like, you know, get it out as fast as you can just to try and rebuild. You can wait and see what the other players are doing. So, you know, OK, I want to cast this and then I want to cast this and then I want to cast this so that I, you know, get as most out, of, get the most out of my cards that I can. Um, and even in like 
uh, a situation where someone is about to board wipe, you can tell when it's coming almost, or at least you can tell when it needs to happen. So holding this up and being able to respond to somebody and then having it as a land later and being able to do that later, I just, I, I, I'm going to stick to it. It's reliable, it's consistent, it's going to stay on the battlefield, and you're going to get multiple uses out of it. Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I think they're both good. I, I was not arguing that uh, you shouldn't play this by any means. I just, I think the other one's a little better personally, maybe, but uh, they're both good. All right, so my last pick for today uh, is another category. Sorry, Jason. Uh, I know you don't like these, but uh, these are creature lands. All right, so creature lands are kind of weird. They are lands that you can dump a bunch of mana into, and they, well, surprise, become creatures. I think these are underplayed in Commander. Uh, people like to poo-poo them because a lot of them are not impressive bodies. They almost always come into play tapped unless you have some kind of other shenanigans going on. So people tend to underrate these. However, the reason I think they're so good is because they're sneaky. Uh, Jason was saying, oh, well, uh, these cards are good because they play around board wipes. So do these. These are creatures that go around board wipes. They are not going to die to sorcery speed removal or board wipes, and you can immediately do something. You can immediately, after a board wipe, start gain in damage if you don't have anything better to use your mana on. And that's really good if you're opponents are close to dead and you just need to get a little bit more out of them they're like oh i need a board wipe because i'm almost dead and you're like okay i'll turn up okay you board wiped me cool but here's my creature land i'm gonna kill you now um but some of them also have added value in the creature type right so there's layer of the hydra which is a hydra good if you're playing a hydra deck there's uh, some that are elementals, which are actually a lot of them are elementals. So that's good if you're playing an elemental deck. So there's things like that where they matter based on like the kind of creature deck that you are playing. Um, but I think the best ones, debatably, are the Restless Cycle. So we got half of these. These are all pretty new. We got half of these in Wilds of Eldraine. We got the other half of them in uh Ixalan. Wow, what's it called? Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Uh so they have attack triggers. So first of all, they're already really efficient. They're dual lands intertapped, but they're cheaper to activate than a lot of the other creature lands and then they have attack triggers. So like the Boros one puts a plus one plus one counter on one of your creatures. The Azorius one makes a map token. Uh the Orzov one drains. They all do cool things most importantly the selesnia one is a llama when it's a creature that's the most important thing about them um these are really sweet i think they're underplayed i think they should be played more than they are i historically don't like creature lands there are only two that i play in any of my decks i play den of the bugbear in my goblin decks because it's a goblin and it makes a goblin an attack, so it you know it boosts up Cranko and how many goblins I make in a turn. I do like that one. And the other one, I don't know if I've ever played it in a commander deck. Maybe my uh, old Traxos deck when I still had that, but uh, Crawling Barons. And I like that one because you can, uh, you know, it taps for colorless, it comes in untapped, and then you pay for it to put two plus one plus one counters on the land, and you get to choose if you actually make it a creature that turn. So. It's something you can dump mana in. If you're not ready for it to become a creature, you can put the counters on. So next time you do want it to become a creature, it'll be bigger, even if you like didn't want to risk it that time. So I do like that one. But otherwise... <sighs> but I think your Den of the Bug Bear argument holds for a lot of these. Like I think if you're like, oh, I'm a tribal deck or a typal deck of some kind, and this turns into that type and I'm in these colors, then I think I want it. Yeah, I I just don't have them personally in any of my decks. Yeah, that's I, fair. Yeah, I can find some spots for some of these, but uh, usually I'm not the biggest fan. This is a very niche situation, but one of my favorite ones is Mutavolt because uh, what you can do with it, you know, so like, you pay one mana into it, it becomes a two-two with all creature types. Like if you make all of your creatures copies of the Muta Vault as a creature. 
all of your creatures that become copies of Mutavolt are just lands. They're not they're not two twos with all creature types. When they're copied, the way that the interactions work is they're just copied as what the card is. So it's just they're just lands. So that's one way that you can actually save your creatures from a board wipe. Like if it's to destroy all creatures or deal di- so much damage to all these creatures. If you make all your creatures a copy of Mutavolt when Mutavolt's a creature, all of your creatures are just going to be lands. They're not going to get destroyed. You're going to be fine. Um, but I actually think that, and I've thought this for a while because I pl- I've played this in a couple of decks, I think Lava Claw Reaches is actually the best creature land because it has an infinite mana sink into it. It's pay X, and this creature gets plus X plus O until end of turn. It's still a land. So if you're playing in a real combo deck where you're making a ton of mana, you can just sink all of your mana into this, make it a 1 million, 1 million. And, you know, if you have, uh, say, I don't know, Keswick Wolf Run, you give it Trample, and now you're murking people. Um, that's that. That's why I think that Lava Color Reaches might be the best one. Um because, I mean, you could sink infinite mana into it. And the Hydra one is the same way. You know, you don't have to tap that uh, uh, to, um, you know, activate it or anything or put the counters on it or nothing. So you can just make X as big as you want, and now you have a huge Hydra that's still a land. Uh, I think there's video evidence of, of this on the channel, but I remember I was playing Arena, and I was playing against a mono green combo deck that... Uh, it made infinite mana, and I was like, okay, do your thing, I guess. I'm not sure how you're supposed to win now. You have no cards in hand. And then they're like, Lair of the Hydra, infinite mana. I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> so it, it, it matters. So uh, I also liked your Mutavolt explanation because that was so convoluted. You could just say Mutavolt is a land that is also a zombie in my zombie deck or whatever, but no, you're like, what if I just made everything a copy of Mutavolt? What? Well- well, Mutavolt can also use its own mana to turn itself on, which is kind of weird. I feel like there should be a clause on there where it can't do that. I think they would template it like that now, but... Not because, I mean, now Lava Claw Reaches can do... All, yeah, actually, of, the I think creature, all, all of the right? creature lands like from the past could do that. Like Lava Claw Reaches could do that. Lumbering Falls does that. I'm looking at the list right now. Hissing Quagmire does that. Like, that's not uncommon for these lands. And honestly, uh, Den of, I, I really Den of the Bugbear that... does that. Den of the Bugbear does that, Preston. Well, yeah, but with Mutavolt, you don't have to attack with it to get a bunch of advantages for having a creature with every type. The other ones, you want to attack with it, so if you tap them for mana to turn them on, you've tapped yeah, on but, the creature. Yeah, but, but think about all of the, the, the typo-type decks that get benefits of yeah. having all those creatures onto the battlefield. So you might not necessarily need it to attack. You might just need it to become another creature. So maybe you make one of your elves bigger, or maybe you're going to draw one extra card, or maybe you're going to make your spells cost one more or less mana. You know, In that sense, you almost are using it for the mana. Also, I think some of these are just decent bodies. Like, as, as, like especially... Like, yeah, you were talking about Lava Claw Reaches, which you can dump a bunch of mana into to be a heavy attacker. But, like, some of them are just pretty efficient. Like like I said, I think the Restless ones, the ones from the new Eldraine and the new Ixalan, they are just good bodies. Like, Restless Cottage becomes a 4-4. Uh, Restless Reef becomes a 4-4 with Death Touch. Uh, the Restless Anchorage becomes a 2-3 with Flying. So it has Evasion as well. Like, these are, they're just kind of decent bodies. <laughs> And they're surprise blockers, too. They're surprise blockers sometimes, too. I like Hall of the Storm Giants. You pay five and a blue, and it becomes a 7-7 seven, seven blue giant with Ward 3. I, it's a lot of mana to pay into it, but... And here's another thing. Th- that's another land that can pay its own cost. Yeah, they. Uh, I think a lot of those... Uh, I think all of the AFR ones are also really good. I think just creature lands the last couple years have been really good. Like the black one from AFR, Hive of the Eye Tyrant. It when it it's a 3/3 three, three that on attacks. Oh, I think it has menace. Yeah, it's a 3/3 three, three with menace that on attacks you get to exile a card from a graveyard. A lot of people want things in their graveyard or need to target something in their graveyard. You're just like, "Okay, I'm just going to get rid of that." So like I'm let's say saying, someone's think... re- let, let's say someone's uh, Emeria is going to pull them a creature back from their graveyard, but uh-oh, I'm going to exile that thing. Yeah, exile the best creature they got, yeah. So I, I I don't think that every deck needs creature lands. 
Um, and even if you do, I don't know how many you can have. Because, again, almost all of them are going to come in tapped. Or, or at least, uh, I guess most of the colorless ones come in, come in untapped. But they're worth looking at. If you care about the creature types, if you care about the effect that they give, they're, they're worth looking at. All right. So um, we're running a little long, but we did want to take just a quick second to uh, go over some of our favorite picks because we asked the uh, people in our Discord uh, if there were cards that they thought that we should add. Uh, and for the most part, uh, we came up with our list independently, but I wanted to talk about one card that was recommended in the Discord that I was like, oh, hey, that is a really sweet card. Uh, and I think the other guys have a card that they want to mention as well that was brought up in the Discord. So uh, my honorable mention from Discord is Arena of Glory. Uh, this is the new mono-red utility land for Modern Horizons 3. Uh, it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a mountain, taps for red, and then for a red, you can tap it to exert it to add double red. And then uh, if that mana is spent on a creature, it gains haste until end of turn. So again, exert, exerting it means that it won't untap during your next untap step. You're basically down that land for the turn. This is actually my favorite of the new Modern Horizons 3 utility lands. And I are I am putting my money where my mouth is. I opened two of these i put them in decks right away and i just bought two more on card kingdom so i'm putting them in decks i am using them i think i think it's sweet the i think haste is incredibly underrated in commander i think haste is sweet but also because of how this works you can use what if you activate it you have the two red mana right you can use one of the red mana on one creature and the other red mana on another creature and you gave two things haste that is awesome. So uh, that's my favorite honorable mention from Discord is Arena of Glory. What are uh, what are your guys' favorite honorable mentions from Discord? Side note, I would encourage people to go back, watch that Modern Horizons 3 episode. Good episode. We talk about a lot of really fun cards. I was also really high on this card in that episode. Uh, I, I was big fan of it there. Uh, but the card that I wanted to talk about that was from Discord was Vault of the Archangel. That's a card that I play in a couple of different decks. And honestly, be, paying four mana to potentially, like, if you... The main deck that I play this in is my Thalese deck, and I make a lot of creatures in that deck. So if I get 15 creatures out there, I pay four mana into this. It's almost like a board wipe, and I gain a ton of life. Because either you block... And all your stuff dies, or you're gonna take a ton of damage from all of my uh, flying spirits. You know, uh, I really like this card. I do play it in a couple of decks, and I think that it's really powerful. It's another card that you know you can activate out of nowhere if you need to. Like if it sat on the board for a little bit, and people have forgotten about it, and they like like let's say like you know you th I throw my one one flying spirit, and you block with like your biggest thing just because you can. I activate this, and now your biggest thing dies too, and I'm gonna gain some life. Uh, so I really, I'm really high on Vault of the Archangel. It's a really good card. Yeah, I I've only played this in one or two decks, and it's awesome. It's so good. Uh, Preston, what's an honorable mention from Discord you want to point out? Okay, well, first of all, uh, for this card, uh, this might be shocking. I don't really like it that much. I, people aren't are going to have a hard time believing that because it gives stuff lifelink, but uh, five mana is a lot, man. It's just... I, but it's it's also says, death touch, and it's all of your creatures. It's all, I, I know. It's all of your creatures. I know five it mana's, is good. Five mana is too much, says the guy who put Rogue's Passage as his number one. Stop. Stop it. But that can just win you a game on the spot. That's a little different. So, so can this... So can this? It, what do you mean? Can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, the honor I mention I wanted to point out was Witch's Clinic. Uh, it taps for a Cutlass, and you can pay two to give a commander lifelink. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I a think this card is cool. <laughs> a little hypocritical, but, you know, paying three to give a commander so you can... If you have two, you could target either one of them. You can technically target someone else's uh, 
I'm not sure how often I'd want to do that. That's maybe a political option I probably wouldn't do too often, but you can. Uh, Here, I, I have one. For all those cards that say if an opponent would gain life, they'd lose that much life instead. Good in those decks. A little niche, but... So, uh, also, keep this in mind. Uh, you have color restrictions, but besides that, uh, Vault of the Archangel is like 60 cents. Witch's Clinic is like $10. <laughs> So that is fair. Keep that in mind, which is clinic is only going to give one creature lifelink. For whereas two other arc, mana, whereas, you can give every creature lifelink. Yeah. That is now, worth obviously, it. Now, obviously and then you have the death on touch color. on top of that. Yeah. So obviously you're restricted on color, but outside of that, I mean. And this is the. I think uh, Preston's I think Preston's tripping. With Vault of the Archangel, I make the same argument that I made for Keswick Wolf Run and the same argument that I made for Alchemist Refuge. Two color decks and up are probably really going to like these cards. Not saying you have to run all three of them in a deck if you could fit the colors. Like that would probably be a five color deck, right? Yeah. I, I think if I think if we took I think if we took all of the lands that we talked about and put them in the same deck. Well, one it would be like what's the theme of the deck? I don't know. But also I don't think you would have enough colored pips in order to cast any of your freaking spells. So, I mean, really, whenever we t- we have episodes like this, you actually do have to look at your mana base and say, is this really worth it? So I I don't buy the argument that Vaults of the Archangel or Kessig Rule Run goes in any deck just because you're in those colors. But if you're a creature-heavy deck, I think both of them are, yeah. Um, I, I wasn't trying to say that you should put them in every deck if you can fit the colors. My point was more... It's not a bad card in those decks. If you slot it in, it's going to provide you with value, and it's going to provide you with consistent value. But I do like Witch's Clinic. I do like Witch's Clinic. I want to. I want to point that out. I think it's a good card. Yeah, I have it in a deck. I, I think it's a. It's a good card. But I would run Vault of the Archangel if it was the right colors for that deck that I have Witch's Clinic in. Uh, but <laughs> so if you guys want to uh, help us come up with cards and topics and stuff uh, for the podcast. Again, check out our Discord link in the description of this video. And it should be in all of our descriptions of all of our videos going forward. I'll try to uh, mention it every now and then. Uh, but thanks for listening. Uh, this was a good episode. Uh, what, let us know in the comments what some of your favorite underrated utility lands are. Not necessarily ones that everyone know are good, right? Like we already did an episode about that too. But if you're one that's like, hey, no one ever talks about this utility land. Why does no one talk about this one? Let us know in the comments. We, we really uh, enjoy keeping the conversation going after we uh hit stop on the recordings here so uh we will be back next week for another episode uh have a good one guys we'll see you later bye